into the inner verse. Welcome to the one within all to the interverse. I'm your host, Chance, and it's a great honor to be once again prying open your third ear and ushering you towards the imagination portal to an expanded perception of this magical reality. Amongst the modern trend towards soul suffocating scientific materialism, there remain sparks and embers of a time when our ancestral mind had not yet been forcibly amputated by the misguided hegemony of homogenized agents of empire. The emptiness of spirit, enforced by inquisitions and witch hunters, has carved out a vacuum within our being, in which the longing for fullness within acts as a cavitation pressure gradient, propelling a pendulum swing, quickening manifest as a genuine grasping at gnosis, a feeling surely shared by all of us who are attracted to podcasts like this one. Perhaps nowhere on earth is this alchemical process more profoundly pronounced than in Germany and its surrounding regions. Home to a people long targeted by papal suppressions and propaganda purveyors, going back to the early Roman expansions and possibly beyond, so much so that Germanophobia remains a pillar of Hollywood storytelling with no so-called social justice warriors to be found at their defense. Our guest today has led a life immersed in these philosophically fertile fields where the germ of man's divinity has been covered by darkness time after time, only to break through into the light as the countless sprouts of wisdom and beauty that could only emerge in a place like Germany. His name is Dr. Christopher McIntosh, and although born and raised in Scotland, Dr. McIntosh has lived a great deal of his life amongst the descendants of those rebellious Germanic tribes, researching a huge variety of esoteric traditions and nature-oriented belief systems. As the author of more books than I could easily count, McIntosh is a living repository of witness to the unquenchable enlightenment process that defines the human condition, and today we'll be discussing his book, Occult Germany, Old Gods, Mystics, and Magicians, a whirlwind tour through the ancient roots of this widely misunderstood nation that takes the reader along for the ride past the so-called barbarian tribes of Roman times, underground alchemists of the Middle Ages, visionary artists and psychological innovators, inventors, neo-pagans, and much more, telling the story of Germany's esoteric underpinnings in a way that only he can. Find his book linked in the show notes along with his website, osgard.net, that's O-Z-G-A-R-D.net, and support the, my, the man's lifetime of investigation while edifying your own occult education. I'm supremely excited to dive into this one, so let's get this podcast started with the Odic Force educator and mystic magic investigator, Dr. Christopher McIntosh. Welcome to Interverse Man. It's a great pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you. A pleasure to be on the show. Absolutely. Yes, this is going to be a good one. And I wanted to just start by covering the groundwork of how you find yourself, uh, you know, in Germany and why that area seems to have attracted you for such a large part, part of your life. You know, the mystic underpinnings of the, the nation, the geography. It, what, what really speaks to you about being there? Well, I've had a long involvement with Germany since my early childhood. Uh, I grew up in the 1950s in Edinburgh, in Scotland, and we had a young German woman staying with us as an au pair. And she was called Ingrid. And I adored Ingrid. 
she was like a kind of fairy godmother to me. And um, so, of course, I came to love her country. And she taught me her first, my first words of German. And um, I kept in contact with her over the years, periodically. And um, at the age of 13, I started learning German in school. And um, then when I began to write about esoteric things, I discovered how important Germany was uh, in terms of the esoteric traditions. And one of the things that I discovered was the Rosicrucian tradition and how important it was. And so I, I wrote a book on the history of, of the Rosicrucian movement. And then later on, I, uh, I went, went on to write um, a PhD dissertation on the, on the Rosicrucians. And uh, one way or another, I, I kept on going back to Germany. Uh, mean, meanwhile, I, I had um, lost contact with Ingrid for a period of about 20 years. And then one day I was on a train traveling from Vienna back to, back to England, and there was a, a rail strike, and the train stopped at Bonn. So I remembered that Ingrid lived near Bonn, and I gave her a call and said, could I stay with her? Um, and so she came and picked me up at the station, and I, I went and stayed with her. And so I reestablished the contact. And I, I remained in contact with her, especially after I, after I moved to Germany about 30 years ago, and um, remained in contact with her until her death a couple of years ago. So that, that, that was an important um, factor in my developing um, my interest in Germany and my, my love for Germany. Um, so that, that's, that's basic, basically um, the, the story of my involvement with Germany. As, as I say, I've, I've been here for 30 years now. I'm married to a German woman. And um, uh, have German citizenship, so I'm so I'm very much rooted here. It's uh, almost a synchronicity worthy of Young himself to have that train, uh, you know, hold up and then wind up yeah. on the leading you on the path to what's basically your your life's working deep passion. That's amazing. Yes. So one of the things in your book that really made me know for sure that this was something I wanted to talk about on the show is your acknowledgement that, you know, referring to what we can know about history, I'm going to quote you, you say, there's a kind of archaeology that is not about digging for bones and pottery shards, but rather probing into myths, legends, customs, symbols, and words. These things too have their layers, their buried messages, their footprints of the ancestors. That's a very, that's an extremely profound statement. That's how I tend to operate as well in my fascination with the, our, our human potential. You know, looking into the deep past is a good way to get an idea of what we might be able to accomplish in the future. And philology, etymology, the rites and rituals of one people or another, these are things that can syncretize and help us, you know, get over the perceived differences and realize that there's a, a shared, deep human experience that the mystical, uh, you know, the mystical worldview opens us up, opens us up to. So um, maybe we could start on that in the, <laughs> the deepest history of Germany and its peoples that, uh, you know, we can be aware of. Hmm. Well, um, the, the interface between history and myth is something that's always fascinated me. The, the way in which history is constantly being mythologized and the way that um, history, uh, uh, myth, myth in turn influences history. And um, one, one of the ways in which this, this happens is on the level of, of national heroes 
who, who very quickly turn into figures of mythology. I mean, we, we, we saw that in Britain, for example, with the, the virtual deification of Princess Diana after her death. So she's, she's now become a, a sort of a, a mythical figure. And um, one can find examples of this in, in Germany as well. Um, there's a legend connected with the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, the, the medieval emperor, um, who is said to be asleep in a cave in the Kufhäuser uh, mountain range in Thuringia. And he said, it, it is said that he, he wakes up every hundred years and asks a dwarf if the ravens are still circling round the mountain. And if they are, he just goes back to sleep again. But um, one day he's going to wake up and come back and uh, lead Germany to great things. Um, well, this, this legend was invoked when Germany was united under Bismarck and a new emperor was chosen, uh, Wilhelm I. And um, on, on this occasion, a huge monument was erected in the, um, in the Kifhäuser Mountains and um, with, with an equestrian statue of the Emperor Wilhelm and, and at the base of the mountain, um, a statue of uh, Barbarossa with um, a raven behind him. So um, this, this was a way of linking the, the, the figure of the new emperor with this, this legend of Barbarossa. And of course, um, at the time of the invasion of Russia during the Second World War, the in invasion was given the code name Operation Barbarossa. So um, that's, that's one example of, of this interface that um, I was talking about. I like that example. And you know, I caught you a few times playing with letter swaps in the book, the way that can be done <laughs> in philological investigations, like the D swapping with the T. There's also a lot of common occurrence of R's and L's swapping. So whether it's just a like synchromistic thread to pull on, or it's indicative of a deeper mythology that our history is actually concealed by or meshed with just Barbarossa as a name makes me think of the ancient Celtic and also Mesopotamian God bell, you know, bar and bell or bail. And yes. the, the second part of his name, you know, vowels are very interchangeable between dialects and, and uh, accents. So I looked at Barbarossa and I just thought, Baal Isi <laughs> and Isi yeah, could no, be no. savior or Isis. And the, the story with the Ravens is, is interesting. You have Odin's Ravens. Um, yeah. Well, although lit literally the name means red beard. I, uh, I also uh, like the statue that is, I've never been to Germany, so there's a particular statue of uh, Hermann, I believe it was called, or Arminius. Yeah, yeah Arminius, yes, who, who defeated the Roman legions in, in the year 9 AD. And um, there's a huge monument to him, um, the, the Arminius monument. And his, in this monument, he's got a winged cap. And you look yes, at his name, does. and it's, his name is essentially a version of Hermes who wears a winged cap. That, that's an interesting thought. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that, but it's true. Yeah, it's just right there hiding out in the name. <laughs> and yeah. this is, you know, this is a, uh, an example of how powerful literacy with symbolism can be for somebody to invoke the sense of the sacred into your worldview. And maybe a, a good place to start in talking about you know, modern Germany as well is what you think the consequences are of mythical illiteracy and, and the cycle of 
mythical repression and re- re- resurgence that has gone on in that area? Yeah, well, I think this, um, this, this has meant that um, Germany has a troubled relationship with its, with its cultural psyche and, and cultural identity. And um, this, this has partly to do with its history because uh, Germany is, in, in one sense, a very old nation. It, it, uh, in, in its previous incarnation as the Holy, Rem- Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, it goes back more than a thousand years. But as a modern nation state, it's really only existed since the foundation of Bismarck's Reich in 1871. And um, it was just getting into its prime as a great power when it, when it was struck down by the First World War. And then soon after that, again by the Second World War. So it, it came to be it came, it came to um, be thought of or seen as the Germans came to be seen as, in, in a way, the naughty children of Europe. And um, to some extent, this is, this is their self-image today. Um, so th- this has had, a, as I say, a damaging effect on the, the um, cultural identity of, of the country. Um, uh, for, for example, um, the, if, you, if you look at the collective mythology, when, when I was growing up in Britain, I was, I was very much aware of the, the cultural history the, uh, the, and the culture, the, the, the inherited, the collective mythology. So I, I, I was very much conscious of um, Historical figures and, and figures from the from the, the figures of legend, like um, well, King King Arthur and the, the whole the whole complex of stories around the, the Knights of the, the Round Table and the Holy Grail and, and all of that, and historical figures like King Arthur who fought the the Danish invaders and. Um, then again, semi semi mythological figures like Robin Hood, and so on, and so um, all of this was very much part of my education when I, when I was growing up. Well, in in Germany, there's a, a lot of people are completely ignorant about their own history and and inherited mythology. For example, when I was teaching English at the University of Bremen. Um, in one class, we got onto the subject of the Holy Grail. Well, now, t- to me, that's one of those universal references. You know, the, the, I, 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 from a very early age, I was um, hearing uh, stories about the Knights of the Round Table and the quest for the Holy Grail and Sir Galahad and, and Percival and, and all of that. Um, but um, I asked the, the students in this class if they knew what the Holy Grail was. And, and only one young man raised his hand and said, oh, well, yes, it, I think it has something to do with re- rejuvenation and um, um, the, the, the quest for eternal life. But apart from that, he hadn't a clue. So um, I, I found that rather sad because um, it's... Um, Something that, that should also be well known to the German public, because one of, one of the great medieval epics is um, Parzival by Wolfram von Eschenbach. And um, then you've got the, the, tri- the treatment of the Grail in, in Wagner's operas, in, in, the, in, in the opera called Parzival, and, um, the, and one called Lohengrin. So it, it is. It is part of the German cultural heritage, but, but, these, but, but these students didn't have a clue. Um, so um, I think that's, that, that's a pity. And um, 
one of the things that, that I hope my book will do is to um, make the Germans more aware of their, their own um, es esoteric and, and mystical history. And um, so hope hopefully uh, at some point it will be translated into German. I really enjoyed the alchemical aspects of the book. And whenever you brought up Parzival, I had heard of, I'd heard of this. <laughs> I was a Brit lit guy in college and things like that, English major. So even got to take an entire course on Arthurian legend. So a lot of this stuff was somewhere in my memory banks, but there was a particular passage you quote from Eschenbach where you basically, uh, to quote it, that the grail is not a Christian relic, but a kind of stone possessing miraculous powers. And he says in the text, Legantinus, Legantinus, the heathen, saw with his own eyes in the constellations things he was shy to talk about, hidden mysteries. He said there was a thing called the grail whose name he had read clearly in the constellations. <laughs> also that a host of angels left in on earth and flew away up over the stars. That really yeah. jumped out to me. One thing I've covered extensively on the show is the the interplay between astro theology or astrology and myth mm -hmm. and religion. And so right. with the grail in particular, I'd never really thought about where might that be up in the stars. My mm -hmm. first thought is potentially the constellation Ophiu uh, Ophiuchus, because it has this it's this transformation aspect of the Zodiac, the constellation stepping up and off the Zodiac and ascension type metaphor. And the, the core of that constellation or asterism is also seen as a stone or a tombstone, like the, the rectangular mm -hmm. block in the center. So mm -hmm. that, that may be what's being referred to. I've often noticed that whenever things are like, you know, mysteries are looked at through the, Astro theology lens and then the alchemical lens, there is sometimes confusion or inconsistency as these two systems use the same language and mm -hmm. symbols, but don't necessarily put things in the same order or have the same meaning behind it. And with that, I'm wondering, you know, have you um, have you done a lot of study of the the star scripture, the scripture in the stars in astro theology, or how that might have uh, been preserved in, and I know there's some artifacts that indicate that the ancient Germans had uh, quite an extensive astronomical mm, interest, but yeah, where, where, where has that type of research landed for you? Uh, well, the, there is, there's one interesting theory about the grail. Um, the, the, the word, uh, there's, there's the, the word um, krater in, in Greek, which means a, a vessel, which, which is cognate with the word crater. <clears throat> and um, there is actually um, the, the, the area that is now the Czech Republic was um, where a couple of million years ago an asteroid fell and caused a huge crater. And um, there's, all, there's always been a special mystique attached to this, this particular territory. And there's, there's a collective memory of, of this event. And um, so there, there is one theory that the grail is, is literally this crater that was caused by this asteroid falling. But, but there, there, are, there are many uh, that, that might account for the or it might help to account for the particular mystique attached to the, the territory of um, Bohemia, as it, as it um, used to be called. Um, what else can I say about, about the Grail? Well, we could also talk about the, well, <laughs> something that just popped in my head. I don't know a lot of German, but I do have some familiarity with ancient Greek and Latin. And when we're talking mm -hmm. about Grail and uh, the Greek equivalent crater as a word, yeah. it's very yeah. similar to another ancient Greek word, 
Kratos or Kratos, which means strength or power. And so there's, there's power in the grail. There could be some wordplay in that. That's one of the things about astro theology and mysticism in general. The, the notion that wordplay and punning represent divine revelation for hmm. the seeker. And I, I love to play with that possibility. But there is um, the Nebra Sky Disc. That had, yes. what, what can we say about that artifact? I really like the old artifacts that you talk about early in the book. Yes, the Nebra, Nebra Sky Disc is, is quite remarkable. That was found um, not long ago. And um, it's, a kind of, it, it's a kind of moon lunar calendar, basically. Um, which is which is very interesting that they they were using a lunar lunar calendar, calendar probably for agricultural purposes. Um, and there have been a number of other architects uh, artifacts discovered. Um, some of them very much older. I mean, for example, there's the the, the Venus of Willendorf, which is a statuette of a um, a large-breasted woman, which is some 30,000 years old and um, found, found in Austria uh, in the early 20th century. And this, is, this has sometimes been taken as evidence that there, that, that there was, um, at that time, a matriarchal culture in, in Europe. Um, there's um, a, an archaeologist, Maria Gimbutas, who wrote, wrote a number of books about this theory. Um, and there have been a number of, a number of other objects dating from the Stone Age that have been discovered. For, for example, a flute made from the bone of a vulture, which is, about, which is even older, it's about 35,000 years old. So, and that that, tell, that says, tells you quite a lot about the, the Stone Age people of that, that region, that they, they had the impulse to, mu to make music, and they had, you know, had, they had the skill to make a flute out of a, a, the bone of a, a, a vulture. So th this sort of um, belies the idea that the people of Northern Europe prehistoric people of, of Northern Europe were, were just um, primitive um, primitive people without any, any culture to speak of. Indeed, they had quite a powerful culture. Uh, another artifact that I hadn't heard of before that you talked about are these conical golden caps. And oh, yes. Yeah. Those are really something I recommend people look that up. Just I think you can find it if you just search like ancient German conical headpiece. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. these things look amazing. Actually, I've had I've had lots of mm, like biodynamic and and subtle energy specialists on the show before. And probably anybody with much of a, a toe dipped into anything new age is aware of. Mm -hmm pyramid power right you know yeah. meditating under pyramids and things of that nature but uh some of my more trusted and respected sources have informed me that actually the cone shape has a better like a uh, magnetic property or stronger many times over than the pyramid and here we have these golden hats that are big cones and gold being very conductive uh, yeah. what, what what are your thoughts on on those particular relics? They're, they're quite amazing. Yeah, well, I think the, the the cone shape is perhaps it's perhaps similar to the to the bishop's mitre, which um, you know may, may may be designed for the same purpose or a similar purpose. Yeah, I think so too. I think that there's a a thread through all of ancient Europe that um, like, okay, let's talk about the magical practice of uh, Seder. I'll let you introduce that. And then, you know, we'll see what we might be able to connect it to the, the Seder magic. Yeah. Well, Seder is the, um, the ancient magical technique of the Nordic peoples. And 
it was actually reserved for women. It was, it was usually reserved for women, although occasionally men did practice it. But the, the men who practiced it were, were rather looked down upon. So it, it was essentially a, a, a woman's art. And um, yeah, so uh, women in the in the Nordic tradition were, were were very much respected, and if if you read the if you read the um, Nordic sagas, they're full of very strong, forceful, self confident women who who often play play an important role, le leading role. Well, they're, they're often, often portrayed as, as much stronger and more forceful than the, the men folk. So this is, <clears throat> this is one of the, I think one, one of the things that um, attracts me to the, to the Nordic tradition. I think one of the most fascinating threads that permeates the book occult Germany is mm. this notion of the mm, union of opposites in almost an alchemical oh, yeah. sense and how yeah. the church yeah. and, and Roman empire represent uh, just one side of a polar polarity or dynamism and mm. is not balanced in that way. And, mm. <laughs> you know, I'd like you to talk about that concept and then, you know, um, I'll, I'll add bits to have you flesh out that I think are good representatives of the notion. Hmm. <clears throat> well, um, one, one has to be aware of the particular nature of German spirituality, which um, has a strong tradition of combining the spiritual and the material. And this, this goes right back to people like Hildegard of Bingen, Hildegard of Bingen, um, who was a medieval um, abbess, and she was also a physician and a herbalist and a composer and much much else. So she was she was someone who very much combined this combined spirituality with with the material. She's a very, very spiritual, religious person, but also very practical, a very effective physician. And she was, she was a visionary. Many, many, of the, many of the remedies that she used um, had been imparted to her in visions. Um, then there was Paracelsus, the, the great 16th century alchemist and physician, again, he, he was also a theologian, wrote, wrote as much about religion as he did about medicine and, and alchemy. And you had um, mystical writers like Jakob Burma, who were, were constantly using alchemical language, al alchemical metaphors uh, in their writings. And um, there's, uh, there's a strong mystique of um, Metallurgy, it, it goes together with the mystique of alchemy. So you, you had um, the, the poet Novalis, who was um, actually, he was a mining engineer. So he, he again, he, he was very, very mystical. He wrote lots of mystical poetry, but again, he, he had this, um, this very practical side. Um, so this this is this is something very German. This this combination of, of the spiritual and the material, and I, th I think this this accounts for why the alchemical tradition was so strong in Germany. And you get you get the same thing. It, it goes right up to recent times with, um, for example, a figure like Rudolf Steiner, who uh, saw himself very much as being in the was a crucian tradition and he was very insistent that spirituality sh shouldn't just sort of float in some 
ethereal realm, but should be brought down into the physical world through the hands. So he developed a kind of um, home, uh, he developed um, homeopathic um, medicines based based on the Paracelsian tradition, basically. And um, all kinds of other very practical things, like his um, biodynamic agriculture, his um, his uh, Waldorf schools, and um, the dance method called Eurythmy, and, and so on. So he, he's another example of this this combination. So as as I say, that that's something very German, and um, it's um, it's it's thanks it thanks to. Thank, to a great extent, it's thanks to German figures that the alchemical tradition is still alive today. When, when you think of a, someone like Frater, Frater Albertus, who came from Germany and went to, went to America and uh, started the Paracelsus Research Society, so I, th I think this is this is one great contribution that Germany has made. I really couldn't agree more. And whether there are spiritual forces underpinning all of these grand movements of history and civilization or some guiding hand behind the scenes in human guise that is uh, responsible for it, I find it fascinating how just the even name to call a people, the germ man's <laughs> a germ is a, you know, in terms of the origin of that concept, it's the, it's a seed containing the generative power, right? So yeah. it's a, it's a life symbol, but yeah. in around the same time period as Germanophobia, I would say was on the rise, but more like in a resurgence, because this has been a cyclical thing going back to Roman times and maybe before, that around the same time between the late 1800s up to about World War One was when germ theory began finding popularity in yeah. European and American medicine practices, which oh, yeah. regardless of people's opinion on it, we'll just we can just say flatly that that's actually still a theory. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually still a theory, whether or not uh, take your beliefs aside, anybody out there, that's fine. But the the consequence of germ theory is very like the consequence of the Holy Roman Empire's uh, inquisitions and such. It's a sterilizing force. It's an anti-life force. It's a neuter neutering force, you know, hand sanitizer on everything. <laughs> and and that is is fascinating because. At the same time that germ became a dirty word, the Germans were moving towards becoming the, the vilified figures of the world for a few rounds of world wars. I find that really interesting. I wondered, you know, what that makes you think of. Um, well, that's, that's um, a, a big subject. Um, I hadn't I hadn't thought of uh, this um, connection between the, the, the word German and, and the word germ, but uh, it's, it's an interesting thought, as you say. You know, may, maybe these maybe these things operate at a, a sort of un, unconscious level collectively. Uh, could be, could be. But um, as, as I say, this is this this um, way in which this this negative image that you, uh, you you talk about has been transferred to the Germans themselves is is very um, damaging. Um, I mean, for, for example, I'm very fond of German folk songs. And, and folk dances, but um, many people look look down upon those things. They, they would say, "Oh, that's all. It's not. It's not what they what they would call in German zeitgemäß, um, meaning um, sort of up to date. It's a sort of it's all kind of anachronistic. You know, things 
things that we we would we rather forget about. You know, we'd 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 rather listen to to modern pop music than than folk songs. Um, and um, you know, this this cultural um, cultural inheritance, if it's allowed to disappear, then it's it's very difficult to to revive it. I think that Germany has noticed that exact sentiment that once it disappears, it's very hard to revive it with mm. the scanty information available about their ancestors' beliefs and practices prior to Tacitus's writings on the Germanic peoples, right? And the yeah. attempts to revive ancient forms of paganism that have been yeah. Yeah. very challenging for any uh, anyone aspiring to do so on a large cultural movement scale. Mm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but back to this union of opposites. I think Young is a crucial figure to this idea being popularized in a psychological way. And mm. I didn't know that Herman Hess also wrote about Abraxas, which I think is fascinating because back to this sterilized only the light, you know, only the masculine, only the father form of religion that the mm. Roman Catholic Church imposed upon Europe. The mm. idea of Abraxas, as Hess says, he says, we had indeed a God whom we honored, but he, he represented only one half of the world. That is to say, the official authorized world of light. But we ought to yeah. be able to honor the whole world. And so we must have either one God who is also devil or side by side with the cult of God, we should institute a cult of the devil. So we had Abraxas, the God who was both God and devil. So there's that. And then yeah. Young has the seven servants to the dead, uh, which I'll, I'll leave it to you to describe that. But it's one of my favorite, um, you know, brief texts of all time. But these, mm. yeah, these polarities in their separation become so neutral. But when brought together, yeah. there's so much power. Yes. Well, um, Hermann Hesse writes about Abraxas in uh, a, a beautiful novel that he wrote called Damian. Uh, do you know that novel? I have Damian. not read that. I've actually only read Siddhartha by oh, Hermann yes. Hesse. Oh, yeah, that's, that, that's a great one as well. But um, yes, in Damian, he... Um, he talks about Abraxas, and he actually he actually got it from Jung. But um, yeah, as uh, as you say, this um, union of opposites is is important. Um, you get that in the Nordic mythology, where you you have, for example, the figure of Loki, who is the the trickster. God who was always causing mischief and um, sometimes very serious mischief. Sometimes, um, sometimes he gets, gets up to really unpleasant things, but, but he is, in a way, he's part of the, he's, he's part of the universe and, and he is, you could say he's, he's sort of the, the grain of sand in the oyster. Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, Loki, he's representative of a kind of trickster figure who, who appears in many mythologies. But, but as you say, in the, in the Christian scheme of things, the, that, that um, element is, is um, left out and, and suppressed. Loki, I I suspect is related to the you know in in ancient Britain the Druids and their notion of the log, which is similar to the idea of the logos or the light. It's philologically mm -hmm. cognate with other words for light, like lux, lux as is Loki. Yeah, and it could be. I I think that uh, I think Christianity is as the Reverend Robert Taylor said, and was jailed for 
in the 1800s, uh, he, he says Christianity and paganism are as different from each other as six and half a dozen. <laughs> and <laughs> the Christianity took the, the old world's system and made it m- into a system of uh, sterilization and control and suppression by, mm. by I think, knowingly it, on some level, separating these poles and making their savior figure, um, you know, and a devil figure that are at odds and irreconcilable. Right. Mm-hmm. And see Loki is very much a, an early logos savior motif. And is one of my favorite of all, all mythological characters, actually, we've done a lot about Loki around here. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And there's not a question in there, but I will move us back over to young because in the notion of the, the generative power and the germ of life that comes from this union of opposites. I think his description of Abraxas is one of the most profound ways to consider what the, what is God or the spirit that, you know, the the more ancient idea of the deity, it's the the unseen mover, (laughs) the the thing that causes everything to move, but is not necessarily physically present. And he describes in the seven sermons of the dead, Abraxas as basically effectiveness itself or power itself mm-hmm. that in the pleroma of all things with mm-hmm. combined with their opposites you know the soup of everythingness that is indistinguishable from nothingness by mm-hmm. it all being mushed together <laughs> the mm-hmm. one thing that stands out is that effectiveness cannot be canceled out by ineffectiveness or mm-hmm. power cannot be canceled out by non-power existence cannot be nullified by non-existence because non-existence is non-existent and to me like that when i came across that it's been spinning the that wheel in my mind for years since that notion came into my awareness and i think it's the perfect way to conceive of god that puts it beyond the idea of good or evil or god and devil you know, mm-hmm. that that yes. effectiveness is the generative power itself that we're talking about the union of opposites being mm-hmm. at its essence. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, I, I, I would go along with that. And uh, <laughs> nothing to add. That's OK. I have plenty of other threads to go to, but. I feel like that might be the the deepest wisdom one can really attain is uh, to get beyond good and evil in that way, just to the pure mm. essence of effectiveness. Mm. Well, let's go back to I liked I really liked the Hildegard of Bingen that you brought Bingen, up. Yeah. Bingen. <laughs> in you quoted Liber Simplicis Medicinae. In all creation, trees, plants, animals, and gemstones, there are hidden secret powers which no person can know of unless they are revealed by God. To which you say, the notion of the sacred in material creation is found repeatedly in German thought. Then, I think that's the ultimate jive of the priesthood, was to convince people that there's a spirit world out there and a material world here, when all evidence of our senses and experience would inform us that there is no separation between spirit and matter. Can we talk yeah. a little bit more about Hildegard and um, even how more modern doctors have tried to apply some of her ideas? Oh, yes. And, and are still doing so. Um, yeah, she was a very interesting figure. Um, yeah, she, she was in, in, in some ways quite unorthodox. Um, she, there, there were times when she, <clears throat> she got into trouble with the church um, for what she was saying and, and doing, but she, she always managed to get out of trouble because she, she was a very clever theologian and she, she, was, she was always able to defend herself very cleverly. But um, she was quite uh, remarkably many faceted. She as, as I said, she was she was a composer. She was an artist. She she painted wonderful pictures of her visions, and um, some of them show orbs. You know, like 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 those orbs that appear in people's photographs from, from time to time. Um, and um, 
Yeah, so she was she was in this in in this tradition that that we've been talking about with this combination of the, the spiritual and the material. And um, there were other German mystics who um, were also quite heterodox, like Meister Eckhart, uh, the, the medieval mystical writer. He was, he was actually a Dominican, a member of the Dominican order, but he was also he also got into trouble with the church and um, at one point was accused of, of heresy. Um, but I, I think before it actually came to the trial, he died of, of, of natural causes. But um, he was he was also in that in that same tradition, and um, he he said in fact that the one one of the things he said was that the soul is identi identical with God, which in a way is similar to the, the 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 indian vedantic notion that that um that the godhead the the, the the supreme deity is actually present in in each each human soul so um the, the, there's there's always been this this tension i think um in 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 the in german history between these rather Heterodox figures and um, the official Christian doctrine. I've particularly enjoyed learning about Meister Eckhart's philosophy and that mm. blending of the Christian and the Brahminist ideals. Mm. There are there are some, you know, my favorite era of mythological inquiry has got to be the period between around eighteen hundred to eighteen forty. There was just, especially the British researchers from around then, they had access to things that are further away from us now and more clouded and cluttered by all the noise culturally that has developed since then. I mean, you go to you do an Internet search on the name of a mythological figure and before you find anything relevant to real life or history, you got to wade through about 30 TV shows and video games that use that name as a character. <laughs> so there's a lot of noise, but I don't know if you've come across the notion that was uh, floating around back then that the, uh, the uh, Saxon people were actually a form of Buddhists that Saka is a, a name of Buddha the, in Japan. They still call Buddha Saka. And the Sase or the Saxons and the the uh, Near East Asian Buddhists, some kind of crossover between their cultures or a even further back, more ancient uh, philosophy or priesthood system developed into the diverging systems that Europe and Asia took on later. Uh, have you seen any evidence to that to support that? I know Hermann Hess as a German and his writing about. Siddhartha Buddha uh, might be an interesting clue to that, but is there anything that rings a bell about what I'm saying with the Saxons and Buddha or Saka? Well, it's, it's an interesting thought. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that, but I mean the the Germans are are obviously part of the European uh, Indo-European family tree, so so to speak, uh, which originated somewhere in probably what it what is now central russia and then spread out in east east and west so there, there are linguistically also all kinds of connections between the european languages and um sanskrit for example um yeah uh i discovered um some some of those connections when I was writing my book on Russia, before before this book, I, I wrote um, another book called Occult Russia. And um, there are very, very interesting similarities between the Russian language and Sanskrit. That's something I'll want to investigate now that I've checked out this book, because Germany and Russia are both areas of 
study for me personally that I've been underrepresented in the grand scheme of things, but you know, I've only had so much time that I've been interested in mythology and history. Uh, but I think this is a perfect time to go back all the way to Tacitus and what he said about the Germans and their religious systems and uh, how even what the Germans call their own nation derives from this more ancient uh, father. Can you talk a bit about their sky god, <laughs> sky god land? Yeah, well, the the, um, the, the, the original sort of um, red primal grandfather of the German nation was Teut, or, or Teos, Teos he's sometimes called, which is cognate with um, a Sanskrit word, Teos, which 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 refers to um, a, a, an Indian sky god, Diaus. Um, so t the word Teos, Teos, um, re really means sky god, or Toit as it as uh, as one variation is. So Teos or Toit had a son called Manos. And Manos was the father of, of the Germans. He had, he had three sons who became the progenitors of three German tribes, the, the Ingevones, Istiones, and Hermiones. So that's the, that's the mythical origin of uh, the, the German people. And the, uh, the, the town Mannheim is named after Manos. But I doubt, I doubt very much if um, many people in Mannheim know that. And that, that's what I wanted to get into. Although the details about that are scarce, mm. it actually does suggest that connection between the Saxons and Buddha Saka, because mm. in Thailand, Buddha is still called Tat. And mm. there are many gods of the ancient world that have this name that goes from a T to a T or a TH to a TH yeah. like Thoth mm -hmm. is a, another perfect example and in particular yeah. that mythos of the the great father and mm. becoming three or having three sons is mm. super common throughout uh, world mythology yeah. particularly the one called Manus is completely similar as like a founder and lawgiver to the the Hindus Menu or Manu or oh, yeah. King Menes yeah. of ancient Egypt, another lawgiver, or Minos mm -hmm. of Crete. There are more examples, but that's just what's off the top of my head. Um, the listeners might be interested in my website, which is it's www dot Osgard, as spelt um, O Z G A R D dot net www dot osgard dot net um, and there um, you, you'll find information about my books and my my lectures and um, and other other things um, my my book occult Germany is is officially published on April the 9th. And um, there's another book that's in the in the pipeline, which is a, a sort of autobiography, which I hope will appear sometime next year. So um, uh, I, I've, I've also enjoyed our conversation. And um, don't think I have anything more, more that I'd like I want to add right now. All right. Well, it's been great to get to share in your experience and wisdom. And now that I've dipped my toes into your work, I am aware that there's a, a vast amount more that you've already done and uh, particularly interested in occult Russia. So thank you for your time. Thank you for staying up a little later to have this conversation across the time zones. And I wish you well and, and enjoy your garden, sir. Thank you very much.
And another great podcast in the archive. It's going into the archive. I loved this episode. Dr. McIntosh is a very experienced researcher with a grounded approach that his book is also really wide ranging. I enjoyed it a lot. There's many things I learned that I had not heard of before. Germany being a topic that I haven't delved into as much overall in my explorations. Maybe it's just, I'm a bit young. I can't touch it all yet. Anyway, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to speak with him. I mean, this is a, a man who deserves respect simply for the, the fact of his eldership. You know, I think he's over 80 at this point and many people younger than that. I, I personally know who are not sharp on the ball and carrying and transmitting wisdom that well. So I appreciate that greatly that we were able to, to capture some of that magic on Interverse for at least one episode. The second hour is super juicy. I think we got him warmed up pretty well by that point. So if you want to have access to the full thing, you know the drill. Patreon or Rockfin are the ways to do it. Or you can join my YouTube membership channel that is brand new. So there's three ways to get the full extended episode. And in part two, we continue discussing the mythical origin of the German people. I really like pulling on that thread of ancient Saxons as Buddhists. And there's so much reason to think that. I'll talk more about that after you know I go through the the bullet points of the plus extension. And there are many bullet points though. <laughs> we talked about the Ermin Sewell, the sacred pillar or tree of the Saxons, evidence of the crucified savior motif before Christianity, <laughs> Odin, <laughs> the sacred center and the tree, their importance to the German psyche, the practice of I'm gonna butcher this word, Wasser Wasserschopfen, the collecting of of magic water on Easter. We talked about the memory and the mystical capacities of water and Germans who explored that in a scientific and spiritual way. We discussed the odic force and orgone energy, how this thread has been perpetually discovered, lost and rediscovered by Germans, it seems. Storks were also discussed, the bringers of the odic force. That was fascinating in context with the Pelagians that we just talked about with Dylan on Inner World Episode 2. The fascinating Rosicrucian concave mirrors as psychic enhancement technology. That's juicy. We also talked about uh, Wagner, who I called Wagner, 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 and the staged sacred festival drama of his plays. Really cool. Neo-paganism was the topic at the end, and we talked about avoiding the common pitfalls of religion for neo-pagans and, and Wiccans and witches. And we talked about the universal truths and the local unique truths. And that was fun. Overall, I thought that the, uh, the second hour was better than the first, but I thought the first was awesome too. That said, if you liked the first even a little bit, $5 a month on Patreon is all you got to pay and you get the whole archive of everything I've ever done. I think that you might be interested in that. I also wanted to talk about probably the biggest key. And even though it's so simple, that was just like, click. How did I, how did I miss that? Is the, the name that the Germans call their own nation, Deutschland. It starts with the letters D E U T, which is just a, a D to T swap from Teut. They were called the, the Teutonic people at one point. And then we talked about this with, with Dr. McIntosh, of course, but that's Thoth, that's Buddha, who is also taught. So much to that. I also considered how philologically the juror of German could be a connection to Kel, as the G and K sounds are interchangeable and the R and L sounds are interchangeable, thus German and Celtic, which are, of course, culturally well identified as as related or similar or the same uh there's other things though in his book that we just couldn't get to particularly would have loved to discuss the german philosophers of the 18th and or the 19th and 20th centuries like nietzsche and and a little more about young i do think we got some good young in there i'm pretty sure this audience is familiar enough with it but german idealism as a 
a subject is fascinating. And there's so many incredible thinkers and suppressed philosophers from that, that it, it's a bit ridiculous. But overall, uh, I think that we could <laughs> think that we could have talked a lot longer. I think the pacing was fine, although uh, Dr. McIntosh was a little concerned about the speed of, of responses or pauses. And I told him, you know what? This audience doesn't care. This audience respects the silence. We're in, we're in it for the vibe and there's a good vibe going on between me and him. So there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> I'm not going to edit out. I used to be such a perfectionist editing out the, the pauses and the ums and the gaps, and there's just no need for it. Another thing that reading his book made me think about though, was how Odin's two Ravens are called Hugin and Munin meaning thought and memory. And that is so similar to Prometheus and Epimetheus, who are forethought and afterthought. Also, Hugin, uh, I've recently learned the, like the name Hugo, for example, it means like intellect or mind. So there's a connection to our Upsilon Eta Sigma or Hughes, which is an epithet of Bacchus, Hugin. And then with that, that eroticism of N's and R's interchanging, the Munin could be a, a mirror or mirror, which is a water idea and phonetically, thus Munin meaning memory makes a little more sense. I mean, there's a perfect example of whether or not that that, that switch between N and R happened in, um, at some point, and that's how Munin became Munin and wasn't Mure or Mir or Mare. The fact is, memory and water are connected ideas, and those those words mean that, and Munin <laughs> is carrying that philological link. Super interesting. Uh, also really like the section about Hildegard, and you know, she's this, I, I think she was like a nun, <laughs> and these modern, there's this part about these modern doctors who applied one of her recipes for treating a uh, I don't even want to say the word because of YouTube, but the big C cancer <laughs> and that this method consisted of a complicated honey wine vinegar extract out of eel gall, eel gall, ginger, long pepper, ivory powder and the powder from a vulture beak, a preparation that involved great difficulties. <laughs> and then they said these doctors, uh, Strelau and Herzka write positively about the use of this remedy in homeopathic doses. That's super interesting. I also didn't realize how many alchem alchemical authors that are famous, like Cornelius Agrippa were actually Germans. Like his first name is Heinrich or that. Uh, yeah. Was it Parce <laughs> Parcel Paracelsus? Paracelsus. Paracelsus. Sorry. Paracelsus. The, Germanness of that guy. He has a like these alchemists just take on a, a mystical name and leave behind their original. But there's so many roots to this stuff in Germany. I really enjoyed the conversation. I hope you guys did too. Hope you're doing well out there. There's tons of ways to support Interverse if you're interested. Uh, but I also recommend supporting Dr. McIntosh and picking up one of his books. He's got a lot of subjects that you might enjoy exploring. Somebody read Occult Russia and let me know what. <laughs> you know, the, the golden thread of gravy within that I'd appreciate it and check the show notes for links to all of his stuff for links to the ways that you can support interverse. There's the merch store. There's typical new herbs. My favorite way you can support me other than getting a tuning use the interverse code at checkout for 10% off. We've also got a new affiliation with Oregonite and the coupon code interverse for that. That's Oregon dash it. O R E G O N dash I T E dot com. Great, uh, great, great stuff. I've enjoyed the pieces that Isaac from Oregonite has shared with me. And I recommend you guys check it out too, especially if you don't have any Oregonite yet. And it's kind of a perfect episode about that because we talked about the Odic force and Orgone energy in this conversation. Didn't even plan it to be all connected like that. And of course, there's the Spirit World series narrated by me. And there's a brand new Spirit World book available as an audiobook now. Book six, Terminalia. Good stuff there. Uh, and last but not least, the new show, Inner World, with me and Dylan Sikosho. We're now two episodes deep on that. 
I'm not going to make any promises or, or commitment to a weekly show with that. I will say it's going to at least monthly, but maybe multiple a month depends on the month, depends on what we've got to share. But I, you know, I wouldn't be mad if we managed to pull it off weekly. <laughs> we'll see. There's definitely stuff in there, deep research that like is, is so profound. It deserves support, meaning $5 a month on Patreon, eight a month on the YouTube membership that, or join Dylan Substack to get access to it. But currently they're coming out sooner on my side. So, you know, you know, you love me do it on my side, <laughs> do both of ours. Actually, you should $5 a month to Dylan Substack is, is worth it to support that guy. He's a great guy. And with that, we're going to wrap it up, but I hope you're having a great St. Patty's day. I know it's like quite far from then uh, at the point you're hearing this, but that's what day it is to, today for me in my present moment. So I'm going to go have some fun with my family and get out of here, but it's been a blast. Love my job. Love that you're here along for the ride and you guys be good. I'll catch you on the next one. Thank you.